Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Gorwa Symposium, which is a, um, a small uh, short series of talks designed to uh, basically help uh, our uh, students who are uh, working on uh, upgrading their assignments into publishable uh, pieces of work. Uh, it's to help them to further refine and uh, uh, get some feedback on their ideas as they are developing. And, and in terms of um, in terms of some background, uh, these uh, this sort of project rose out of the core examples of uh, linguistic structure uh, course, uh, which was taught uh, last semester here at Leiden University. And uh, of the assignments submitted, um, we had Alessandro Clemens and Yurian. Uh, were uh, all interested in um, uh, sort of growing their 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 assignments past uh, the point of a a term uh, paper and into something that could be published. And of course, given the state of uh, documentation and description of Gorwa, uh, I, I think it's very exciting that we have uh, people who are willing to work on the language and engage with maybe data that hasn't been. Uh, as elaborated or data that is not as familiar to um, a student of linguistics as perhaps uh, an, a better documented or described language. So uh, here we are, and um, uh, basically the, the backbone of, of, of today is going to be these three uh, presentations and, and the questions and, and discussion that surrounds it. Um, and before that, I'm just going to start. I'm going to try and set the uh, scene with some uh, with some brief comments and some context um, about the Gorwa language and uh, and where the uh, study of the Gorwa language could go or where it is going. And uh, then I'll talk about some brief housekeeping and procedural notes, and then we can actually get into the exciting part that is the uh, presentations themselves. So Gorwa is a uh, South Cushitic language. It's spoken in North Central Tanzania in and around uh, Babati town uh, and Lake Babati. So I'll, uh, I'll play this little uh, bird's eye view care of Google Maps just to give us some context. And it's spoken by about 135,000 uh, individuals uh, all around sort of uh, this uh, mountain to our left, Mount Quara, Galapo, uh, and uh, as we sort of turn to the south towards Dodoma region, there are Gorwa speakers uh, sort of in the northern part of Dodoma region, but are mainly in uh, the Manyara region uh, where the camera is located now. So we can also see the volcanic uh, mountain Anang, uh, an extinct volcano. We can also see the uh, Rift Valley escarpment. Uh, up on this escarpment is where the uh, speakers of the South Cushitic language Iraq uh, mainly live. So this is sort of a brief, uh, a brief tour of the area in which uh, it's spoken. Uh, for a little bit more context, you can see up in the right hand uh, corner, if we look very closely, we can see the snow capped peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is at least a day's uh, travel away by car uh, in terms of scale here. So um, the language isn't spoken over an incredibly vast uh, area. If you were to fall asleep in a, uh, in a bus, you would possibly miss it. Um, you close your eyes um, as, as you go along the road. Uh, but I said, as I said, it's spoken by about 135,000 uh, individuals in uh, mainly in North Central Tanzania in the area um, shown. In terms of what Gorwa sounds like, uh, I'd like to provide uh, um, a quick uh, video uh, of uh, Akobu Sapare, who talks about farming sisal when he was uh, younger. So I'd like to provide a quick uh, video uh, of, uh, of how the language sounds and, and, uh, and how it looks gesturally as well. <laughs> Antoko <laughs> 
ሙግደ ኡረን ኩልቡሽ ሊንጽያ ቆዶሲ መጣ ቆዶሲ መጣ ቆዶሲ አሎና ዲሳባቦ አሎ ዲሴሉ ካሴ አካ ኦማሳ ወራር ካሴ ጋዛ ቆመርጥ ዋይ so that's a, a quick example of the sort of sounds and gestural look of uh, of uh, of gorwa um uh so essentially we can hear those of us who are familiar with sort of uh, the more common bantu languages of tanzania will recognize right away that it has a very different sound uh, system different general grammar uh in uh sort of in total um in terms of in terms of the work that uh is being done uh on gorwa right now um as i see it you know there there are sort of these prominent questions uh that sort of emerge right now in in our examination of the language and 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 things that we've talked about um sort of recently and things that are in my head uh, so before we begin these uh, these talks uh, i'd like to sort of uh, put it in context in terms of these sort of larger questions that haven't really been answered yet the the first large question is how are gorwa and iraq different certainly there are grammatical features and lexical features that distinguish uh, gorwa and iraq um but uh, the two languages are uh, mutually intelligible and uh, it seems and i think that and i think that uh, martin uh, mouse would agree with me um that the more that we look at the uh, grammar of the uh, languages uh, possibly the more difficult it becomes to distinguish uh, the two languages but 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 you know when you speak to speakers of gorwa many will say well we speak gorwa and if you speak to speakers of iraq many will say that we speak iraq um specifically this is older speakers younger speakers uh will often uh, not distinguish the two they'll say well i speak mbulu uh and i am of the uh, mbulu ethnic group uh so often when you uh, when you as an outsider speak to a speaker of gorwa or even a speaker of iraq they will refer to themselves as mbulu speakers or uh, mbulu people um this is uh, sort of related to a larger discussion that martin and uh, richard griscom and i had with um some of my uh, gorwa consultants and and participants in gorwa research uh, we had uh, recently i believe it was early this year in babati um and uh, sort of this discussion how how are these languages different how are they the same and uh it's very much sort of a social question i believe and uh, and uh, i think it has to do with people's perceived histories and uh, and and people's perceived common myths and i think it's something that's fluid as well a, a gorwa speaker when uh, when in a place that is not a gorwa speaking area if they are say for example in a big city or if they are going to a large university um they will often uh, they'll often join uh, help organizations mutual aid organizations with uh, iraq speakers for example um there's enough shared context and history and sort of ethnic identity for gorwa and iraq speakers to feel comfortable um with each other and with that said um you know this sort of distinction one has to wonder how much of a hand the uh, colonial um occupiers uh, in the uh, past centuries had to do with creating this distinction um the uh, the fact is that both sort of um inhabit uh, different places the iraq uh, live up on the uh, top of the uh, the mbulu plateau so they live in the highlands and the gorwa live uh, in the lowlands uh, both areas were were difficult to sort of be administered from one uh, from one uh, point uh so um the idea of uh, distinguishing two different uh, ethnic chieftains was um possibly to the uh to the colonizers advantage um so these are interesting questions with regards to the ethnicity um that uh have to be uh picked apart and uh, tied up with that is also the language how people hear it and how people feel it is different or they are different from one another um also gorwa pragmatics um i know that in the sketch grammar that i worked on for my dissertation um the question of pragmatics was largely ignored um in favor of um phonology and morphosyntax so questions such as intonation versus uh, tone uh, how how does that play into the pragmatics of gorwa 
um, what role do pragmatic markers play uh, in uh, the pragmatics of the language, and uh, what role does word order manipulation play in the pragmatics of the language. Happily, um, uh, we are uh, sort of building our collection of um, natural or naturalistic Gorwa um, texts or natural examples of speech like the one that I played for you earlier on. So we're, we're starting to get richer and more nuanced uh, data that goes beyond the level of, um, of a simple uh, sentence. So uh, hopefully these questions can be delved into uh, in your few, but all things are sort of up for grabs. Um, and also, you know, sort of in a, in a larger, more methodological or long-term uh, scheme, what does Agorwa linguistics look like? I always have fun talking to my, uh, my Gorwa um, local researchers and consultants about the fact that there are thousands of English departments all over the world, and uh, there are no Gorwa departments yet in universities. And uh, it sort of brings me back to this quote that um, I often use um, from uh, Felix Emeka and Marina Turkarafi's 2019 uh, paper. They asked, what would linguistics look like had it been based on African language practices and data? And I often ask myself, I wonder what would, uh, what Gorwa language studies or what a, a Gorwa department would look like? What would be the everyday concerns, the everyday research questions of, of Gorwa professors or teachers of Gorwa language and literature? What would we see coming out of, a, of an environment like that? Um, uh, in terms of sort of larger context, I've, uh, I've conducted uh, research with the Gorwa language since 2012 now, and I've been very lucky in that um, I've been able to involve uh, a lot of local speakers in actually collecting and uh, transcribing and translating the data. Um, and it's only very recently that I found that this fits quite neatly into, into a model proposed by Paolo Freire in 1968. Uh, and and uh, this was published in English in 1970 from the original um, Portuguese, I believe, um, in which uh, sort of the process is identifying or sort of getting local people to work on their own cultural milieu. So going out and uh, doing recordings and interviews with uh, their families or with their neighbors or with other individuals in their community um, to learn more from sort of an inside and emic perspective. And uh, it's funny how, how, how well um, the local researcher sort of model fits in with, with, with Freire's uh, model. Um, it, uh, sort of as, as part of this, he, uh, he, he identifies um, a methodology. And uh, it's nice in that, in that it, it sort of paints uh, some, some waypoints uh, for how to take a project like this further. So, you know, as I look at the Gorwa project, We've had, you know, a year or two or perhaps three, depending on, on where you want to uh, mark the start of when people started doing uh, research, formal research on the language. Um, and they've collected a lot of material. We probably have 400 hours of recorded things like interviews and songs and stories. Um, and Freire identifies this point as, as sort of a, a going out and, 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 and an auto sort of documentation. and, and he sort of identifies the fact that now what has to happen next is that these local researchers together with the aid of outside um, anthropologists and, uh, and other individuals should come together and talk about the sort of the generative themes that they've identified again and again throughout the work. What is it that people seem to think is important and how should we go about researching that? Uh, so so the, these are sort of exciting uh, waypoints and exciting directions that we can take a primarily linguistic documentation uh, into the future and uh, and further developing uh, a possible Gorwa linguistics. Um, so these are some these are some small tidbits and some small sort of pieces of context. Uh, this particular symposium is is mainly going to be focused on the work of Alessandro Fontana, Clemens Mayer, and Jurian Wigertjes. Um, uh, and, and the work that they've been doing in uh, developing their assignments into uh, publishable papers. So we've been sitting down now for probably the past two months or so, um, having, having uh, maybe two or three hour periods where we will uh, work together on our writing. We'll sit down and we'll write and we'll uh, share with each other what we, uh, what we are working on 
uh, this week and, and the goals that we have for writing. Um, so Alessandro Fontana will be uh, presenting on Swahili loanwords in the Iroquois languages, morphology and periodization, which I think uh, will have interesting things to say about possibly how uh, the Gorwa language and the Iroquois language uh, deal with um, loanwords in different ways or have uh, encountered loanwords in different ways. Um, the work, uh, the uh, topic uh, presented by Clemens, Discourse Organization, Referent Tracking and Gorwa Narratives, of course, speaks to, uh, speaks to uh, sort of the pragmatic question, as does Yurian's work in the syntax of O in Gorwa, which has been a, uh, has been a topic that has been uh, also looked at by Liz Kerr uh, recently. There's lots of interactivity here in the past little while. Um, uh, for our participants and for our uh, attendees, uh, each of these presentations will uh, probably take around 20 to 30 minutes in total, so 15 to 20 minutes uh, of actual presentation time with 10 minutes for questions at the end. And uh, questions uh, will be at the end of each talk, uh, and um, attendees can, can write their questions uh, in the chat module here in Zoom or uh, they can ask a voice question uh, by uh, using the raise hand function and um, you will be unmuted and allowed to ask a voice question at that point. Um, these talks are going to be uh, recorded. Uh, so for, everybody, uh, for everybody's knowledge, um, your voice will be uh, recorded. Um, and the individual talks will be available at the DOIs um, indicated here on this slide. Uh, so uh, once the uh, symposium is over, I can process these videos and I will uh, make them available online uh, for, uh, for everybody to listen to and to uh, engage with um, as well in the future. Um, so with that said, uh, I'd also like to um, thank uh, a couple individuals, obviously the presenters for uh, being interested in uh, in engaging with, uh, with I think, this uh, maybe complex and, and very rich and interesting, but also perhaps difficult topic. Uh, I think that um, uh, they've all been uh, doing some really uh, excellent work and engaging with questions that I've been thinking about, but in very different ways and with very different uh, talent and skill sets. So it's very exciting and it really um, adds, a, adds a great level of richness uh, to the work on the Gorwa language. I'd also like to thank uh, Martin Mouse uh, for um, sort of providing uh, support and uh, in this sort of uh, small project and um, uh, also attending all of our, all of our small writing uh, sessions and, uh, and sharing his ideas and sharing his, uh, his experience with Iraq and his work with South Cushitic in, in Tanzania. I'd also like to thank uh, Richard Griscom who is silently floating in the background today um, and is uh, sort of looking after the technical aspects of uh, this presentation and uh, who has actually um, facilitated a lot of our writing groups as well. Richard's been a fantastic sort of co-PI in the current project that we're working on and uh, it's really nice to have him on board uh, with this project as well. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now and I am going to uh, pass uh, the uh, microphone over to um, Alessandra Fontana, who's going to be talking about Swahili loan words in the Iroquois languages, uh, morphology and periodization.